Okay, so I just wanted to add um, a comment here. I talked about, um, hang on here. I talked about Gauss elimination. We talked about weak scaling, and I thought, why not show you what weak scaling looks like for Gauss elimination? Because remember, I said you got to have a model, and with with Multigrid, it was sort of easy. You just had every processor have exactly the same size problem all the time. And it's like each processor has a little tile of the problem that gets cookie cuttered out. Gauss elimination is different, OK? Gauss elimination has this rule for scaling. So in other words, if you, if you increase the size of the problem, then it goes like, OK, I'm, there's, a, there's a slight difference in the way I've written the notation here and what's coming here. But let me just say what I mean here. So if you increase the size of the, the, the dimension of the matrix by m, then the execution time goes up by m cubed. OK, so that allows you to do the following. So now I'm going to call capital N, the data size, little n squared. OK, and I'll assume that that's divisible with some parameter, which is going to be our, our uh, parallel parameter. And I'm going to take the number of processors to be n by k. So each processor is going to keep k copies of the k columns of the of the original matrix. And so here's what the the efficiency would be. That's just the definition. Um, I've what I've done here is I said I'm going to solve a, an n squared problem with p processors, and I've just rewritten what n squared is. So n if p is this, then n squared is that, and According to my scaling law, I can pull out a factor of p cubed and cancel out this p here. So I get this expression for the, the rule. Assu assuming this is true, this gives me an expression for the efficiency, and I've got a smaller amount of memory down here for the sequential problem. Okay, so this just, since we're a little bit behind, I'll just let you look at this on the, the web page. Um, what you find out here is this is the, the weak scaling rule for Gauss elimination. So it's going to say that what I need to look at is the sequential time for a problem that has one pth the information. That sort of makes sense. So I divide the amount of, of data by p. That makes sense. But instead of just having you know, the same the ratio of the times as we did with, with multigrid, it's going to be multiplied by p squared. So that means this is going to be a much smaller number than, than this is. It's going to run very fast. OK, so that's weak scaling for Gauss elimination. OK, then we looked at um, these uh, different algorithms for um, triangular solve. And let me just mention one key point here. So we did this big reduction, and we ended up with a, a set of equations to solve. OK? And Remember, I said this one is trivially parallel once you've got the z's, but this is a recursion relation. So this one has to be done somehow. And I said, well, if it's done, no, thank you. I could do without that aspect of preview. Um, so I said, if that's done sequentially, then we get a, a, a scalability up to the square root of n divided by the, the um, bandwidth. So that's good, because we can scale up to very large problems. It's also good for small bandwidth. The toy duck algorithm, remember, was good for large bandwidth. Now we have something good for small bandwidth. But what about being a little bit more aggressive on this problem? Why would you solve that sequentially? You would think there must be some parallel algorithm for it. Well, here's an observation. I can write that in this sort of funny way. I'm going to write this as a matrix multiplication. And to do so, I have to expand the matrix a little bit. So I'll take this matrix and put it in the upper left-hand block. I'm going to put a vector here and so forth. And you just check that this is correct. In other words, I can get the new value of xi from the old value by multiplying by a slightly larger matrix, w plus 1 times w plus 1 matrix. That means that all these xi's can be generated by a bunch of matrix multiplications. These matrix multiplications, 
by induction. I've just said that this is HI times the previous one, or this one is HI minus 1 times the previous one, and so forth. By induction, you have an expression involving this. And parallel prefix is an algorithm that allows you to compute things like this by using a binary tree. And this is a very cool algorithm. And I want to introduce this because, you know, sometimes you just want to look at cool algorithms. And this is a very cool algorithm. It's like the summation algorithm that Professor Gomez talked about earlier, but that was just for summing up the total thing. This is going to give you all the individual partial sums or partial products, and they'll be deposited at the right place. So the ith partial result will be at the ith processor. And it's a, it's a, a, a binary tree, so it's an, a log n process. Um, so what we do is we just, this is what we're after. The GIs are computed according to this matrix multiplication rule. And um, the, this is the amount of uh, computation that's involved in the amount of communication, where kappa is the log of the size of the problem. Somewhere up there, I've said what kappa is. Kappa, you see, is the size of the, the problem we're solving. Two, two to the kappa is the size of the problem we're solving. OK, so very cool algorithm. And um, a side note, it's, so this actually might, you know, we could write our, we could, this might be our linear problem that we're trying to solve. That could be the triangular problem. That's an example of one of the triangular problems we might have. And you might say, oh, well, well then why are we bothering with this other algorithm? Why not just use parallel prefix? Surprisingly, as a standalone algorithm, it's not a very good triangular solver. So you can go through that here and see what the, the difficulty is. But parallel prefix alone would not be a good triangular solver, but it's a very good helper. So if you put it together with the previous algorithm to solve that very small subproblem, then you get improved scalability. So basically, p can be order n. It's p log p of order a constant n divided by something. The bandwidth is what we had before, but now we've got a bandwidth squared term. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, there, are, there are some details there. But we've gone from being the square root of an expression like this, except we didn't have w squared, to being linear in that. So this really does scale up quite a bit. And so there is yet another, we've now seen four or five, I guess, different algorithms for doing triangular solve, right? I've added, you could, you could do parallel prefix alone. That's not a good algorithm, but it is an algorithm. And then when you put parallel prefix with the previous algorithm, you get yet another algorithm. OK, so lots of different algorithms to solve the linear recursion relation, the linear triangular solve problem. What about solving some ODEs now? Well, if you, have a, if you have a linear ODE, then it's the same thing we just had. And this is some work that I've done just recently with a, a graduate student at uh, Chicago um, and in the chemistry department. And I just want to share this with you. This is really new stuff. And I, I wanted to go from the really basic stuff we did the first day up through some well-known stuff. And now this is kind of wild and crazy. So it may be wrong. You never know. But anyway, I wanted to share with you what we're thinking about here. Um, if you look at an initial value problem, it seems essentially sequential. However, linear systems have these scalable algorithms we just looked at. So let's look at that. So let's just think about we have some sort of ODE like this that we want to solve. And um, you might think of a pendulum problem, for example. And if you were to linearize the pendulum problem, you'd end up with an, and you discretize it with standard difference methods. Then what you get then is just a recursion relation, simple linear recursion relation, which is the same thing as saying a banded linear system, banded triangular uh, system to solve. So we know how to solve systems like this. That's what we just talked about. There are scalable algorithms for it, and we could use that. What do we do if it's a nonlinear system? That's where the, the difficulty is. Well, why not apply Newton's method? I mean, the, the, the universal panacea for solving nonlinear problems is to apply Newton's method. And I, I can write down um, my difference problem as an equation f of u equal to 0. 
in kind of the obvious way, and there's some details here, and then I apply Newton's method, and this is what the Newton step would look like. Um, and now this is going to be just another banded linear system. So I apply the previous, uh, previous algorithms. Now, so uh, what can go wrong? I mean, so I've reduced the problem to a sequence of linear steps. The only question is, how many linear steps are there? So how many steps of Newton does it take to converge with this? Well, let's look at it. So um, let me just flip down here to this picture. It looks like a commutative diagram, but it's a non-commutative diagram. It doesn't commute, but it spiritually commutes. So here's the idea. I have an ordinary differential equation. I can apply a difference method. I get a system of equations, finite dimension, and I can apply Newton's method. So I've got a discrete Newton method. That's what I'm talking about working on. But I could also think of applying Newton's method to the ODE in function space. All right, so f of u equal to zero is my equation. That means u satisfies an ODE. I can apply Newton's method to that, and I get a linearized ODE. And in the notes, you'll find a way to derive the Newton step derivation without having to differentiate in function space. And this is what's going on here. You can differentiate in fun function space. You'll get the same thing. The, the key thing to remember is that the Newton step will turn out to be solving a linearized ODE. Okay, so that means that when we, if we were to then apply a difference method to it, we can solve that with our fancy scalable linear triangular solvers. Now, why this picture is important is it tells us what's going to happen in the limit of small time step. It says that this thing, which is what we're going to compute, is going to behave a lot like this if the discretization process is, is faithful. In other words, if the mesh size is small enough, we, we should converge to what happens in, in this um, infinite dimensional sit setting where I start with the OD and then I apply Newton's method to it. So things ought to tend to a limit as, as the step size gets smaller. Now you got to think about how you get Newton's method started in this case. We've got an ODE to solve. There are lots of different possibilities. One thing we started with was a very stupid thing, but it works remarkably well. That is, we just take the initial guess to be constant. So we've got you know, initial data here somewhere. Where's our initial data for our ODE? Um, you know, we've got our initial data. And I could just take the function to be constant, f, you know, u the whole way through. So that's our going to be our first way to do it. Uh, then we'll look at some more sophisticated techniques. OK. And we're going to, to start with this, let's just look at a simple orbit problem. The, you know, the Earth going around the sun. So that is, here is what the, that looks like. It's just, you know, gravitational attraction. And um, so you're going to get an elliptical orbit. Uh, this is actually kind of, I don't know, if, if you've never done this before, don't do Euler's method. <laughs> this is what we, we call Verlet. It's the center difference approximation. And um, this is Euler's method, and it spirals out. Well, you could do implicit Euler. That would spiral in. <laughs> it doesn't work. OK, so you have to be careful with which difference method you take. And um, let's see what happens. So here's, let me explain this pictogram here. So here's the orbit in green. And this so-called time axis is actually, it's not time, it's the iteration axis. So we're doing different Newton iterations. So the way it works is that I'm depicting the, the problem I'm trying to solve at the beginning, the, the zero iteration. And here is my approximate solution. So that's just constant in time. And I do one Newton step, and here's the answer that I get. Now, I should get this green orbit, but I don't. It, like, it, it sticks with the orbit for a while, and then it goes off like it was a slingshot, right? OK, it does that. But then the next Newton iteration, it wraps around a little bit further, and a little bit further on the next one, and the next one. And then by the fifth one, to, to the eyeball norm, it's identical to the right answer. And by the eighth one, it's gotten down to our 10 to the minus 10 tolerance. So Newton's method works. So, um, and you can look at 
how many Newton steps are required as a function of the number of steps in the trajectory, and you get plots like this, and we've looked at a lot of such plots. Really what you want to ask is how does it depend on, solution, on simulation time? Because we know if we take the time step small enough, we should converge to this thing which is the continuous Newton method. So there should be a, a, a coherent limit. Well, there is a coherent limit. In fact, so coherent, it's, it's not a very interesting slide. All of these different time steps all collapse onto this one, one picture. So there is a rule here. That is, we can say that the number of Newton iterations is, is linear in the, the uh, well, bilinear in the, the integration time tau and the, the time step. Now, that's good news because it says that uh, if we fix the integration time, we can keep the, the lid on the number of iterations by making the time step small enough. So there is, there is some possibility for this algorithm. Um, and so then you can say, okay, how, does, how would this scale if you have that? So what we know is we can solve our, our linear system in this sort of complexity if we choose things right. I mean, choose that really good algorithm we had at the last step. And so um, each Newton step is going to cost something this, this order. Um, and then we just have to know how many Newton steps we're, we take. So here is our estimate for the um, parallel computation. So we've got a bunch of parameters in here, but um, the main thing is this parameter B, which we had on the previous slide, which tells us how many Newton steps, how, they, how it behaves as a function of the time step and the, the length of integration. And the point is that um, B goes to zero with delta T. So, um, and so then the speed up is going to look like this where A is a parameter that we control. It's a granularity parameter for the, for the process of, of parallelizing the, the, the linear problems. And beta is this slope of that curve we saw before. So that sort of in, depends on which problem we have. But, but notice that uh, if we let delta t go to 0, then the amount of speed up we get will go as large as you want. Now, this is not a scalable algorithm, but it says there is some possibility in getting speed up <clears throat> if, if the time step is small enough or if the time integration length is small enough. OK. So um, now, unfortunately, the efficiency doesn't look so good because really, I haven't done anything interesting here. In a way, all I've done is just take, I mean, the ODE uh, can be solved in just by sweeping through once. And I proposed to linearize it and then sweep through i times. So clearly, my efficiency is going to be 1 over i. So it's not, if, if somehow you end up with many, many Newton steps, it's not going to be so great. So we have to, there's a, a trade off here. We've created some parallelism, and there is, um, there is uh, you know, a cost for that. OK, so what if all of this we've talked about so far was just if the initial uh, step was a constant in time step. So now um, suppose we choose a, a smarter thing. So let's just say we're going to start with a 10 times larger time step. So we're going to do that in s sequentially and see what happens. Well, what does happen? Well, now as you make the time step smaller, the number of Newton iterations really gets pushed down. So Eventually, this would just be flat. I mean, as, as this goes to zero, this just goes to a flat line. Because essentially what we're saying is we're, we're converging to that, that continuous time case. So um, you know, it says that if you've got a really small time step, yeah, this could be really a very viable algorithm um, so as long as you take a, a reasonable first guess. So that's, that's also encouraging. OK, but that's a fairly simple problem. What about something really tough? The Lorentz attractor. Let's take something chaotic. So here's the Lorentz attractor. If you've never seen this before, it's a system of three ODEs. And what's depicted here in, in green and red are two nearby solutions. So they start out here, very close. You can hardly see the difference. And then they evolve. I don't know which. It's kind of hard to follow, but they go around. and. 
there are these two attractors, which you can see that after a little bit of time, they're completely different. Here, the red one's going around. There's no green one. It stopped here. The green one went around here more and more times. So this is very chaotic. This is the simplest uh, example of chaos that uh, one can do with an ODE, as far as I know. So, so this one's much more challenging. This is not like the orbit problem, where it's very boring, where it just goes around and around and around. This is sort of orbiting around, but in an unpredictable way. OK. So um, here's what you see. So as the number of Newton iterations to converge as a function of the simulation steps goes up sort of linearly for a while, but then it hits a wall. And then at a certain point, it just quits working at all. Um, and then if you look at several different time steps and have the axis be time, we're expecting them to coalesce. Well, they are totally coalesced. So um, we, we are confirming that simple model that I had with the non-commutative diagram. And uh, the difference here is that there is just a, a, a point beyond which the simulation can't go. Yes? Ah, that's a good question. Actually, this is a very good point that I should have said as I went by. This is a very unusual scenario for Newton because it's solving an ODE. There's a unique solution under reasonable assumptions about the ODE, Lipschitz, da, 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 coefficients. There's only one problem to be solved. There is no other solution for Newton to go off to. Yeah, but it's converging to it, I argue. Okay, yes, you're, you're raising a good... This is, thank you very much for that good point, which I hadn't thought about. <laughs> but apparently, it's, yeah, these are not wandering off to some other extraneous solution. Uh, remember, they're pinned at zero. So they're going to be, they're forced to be close to the right trajectory. I'm, I'm making this all up as I go. Well, I, I disagree. Okay. But, but, well, I mean, you're, you're well taken. I haven't, I haven't figured out quite how to answer it. But, but the point is, as you go along in the simulation, remember at zero, you've got the right answer. So they, they, they would, you would see something if they wandered off to another branch of the, to, remember, I mean, yes, your discrete problem is not a di, you know, continuous dynamical system, but man, to get to another solution for that would be a huge jump. It would show up in our computations. I will check it for us. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. I mean, for that reason, I wouldn't expect, in general, that's this behavior here. Some time at all. Oh, yes, I agree. Oh, I, I know, I understand what you're saying. That's this phenomenon here. Yes. Well, certainly there are n solutions. But here, here they're all tracking each other. They are all similar. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we need to check that. I think the point you're raising needs to be verified by a picture, right? I need to have norms on da da da, and I don't have that. Yeah, I, I, I'll let you know. Don't worry, you'll get an email. <laughs> Thank you, David. Do you understand why the complexity looks linear in uh, in the time? Because I I would expect something that wasn't because Newton is quadratic. You know, it's getting faster and faster towards the solution, so I do it should be. It's like in the region of convergence when I'm when I'm iterating, I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a question uh, having to do with ODE behavior. Why isn't it exponential? Yeah, I would have thought I would. I was expecting to see exponential. So I will. This is a this is a, a, a question that has to be answered. But it's a question about application of Newton's method to ODEs, which and I know the right people to ask, but I, I don't know, uh, at this point. These are great questions. Um, if you take, if you take a, a better initial guess, you know, take a, a coarse time step. You get out a lot farther in time before you hit the wall, but you hit the wall because I think of what David was saying that this is a chaotic. You know, you're just on the you're you're on the, the you're circling around the wrong attractor at that point. Um, there are of course other approaches. I, I apologize here. I've been very non-tutorial like today. I'm talking about a new idea that I've got that I'm all excited about. Um, 
there are many other ideas that have been proposed to do, um, you know, to get parallelism out of ODEs where it's hard to do. One of the classic ones is to go to a very high order time stepping method, which gives you a lot of work to do. For example, high order Runge-Kutta methods are one, one thing that's been used. Taylor methods would be another. So you've created in each time step a very large amount of work to do, and you can get parallelism ab about that. The, the downside of that is you're forcing yourself into a very, very high order um, time stepping scheme, and that may not be what you wanted to do as opposed to working with a low order scheme like Verlet. Uh, there are some, uh, also some new methods uh, called para-real or para-real in, in French uh, that uh, Yvan Madé and, and uh, um, um, Jacques-Louis Lyons uh, developed. And um, there's some relationships and some differences. And I have to, you know, I have to defer to looking at our paper to see uh, more on that. Um, but they involve a serial section, which is uh, the parareal uh, methods involve a serial section, which plays a role as a preconditioner. The techniques here could be integrated with those in a way to um, get better scalability um, by being a preconditioner, playing the role of the preconditioner, uh, or just as the solver. So those are, those are some other approaches. Uh, so where would all this go? Well, we. We've seen that this idea has some promise, um, but it's got a limitation in terms of the scalability, uh, or in terms of the efficiency, because it's replicating the work you would do uh, for the OD in the, in the uh, sequential case. But suppose you weren't doing explicit time-stepping schemes. Suppose you're doing implicit time-stepping schemes. Well, then you're going to have to do a Newton iteration at each time step. Well, but why do it at each time step? Why not do it on the whole system? In that case, then you really, there is no duplication of effort. It's just a different way of doing it. So I'm just saying, why not, why not view your ODE as a collection of time steps to be worked on at once? And I think with that in mind, then there are a lot of different things that um, come to mind. Of course, you're immediately going to think about Navier-Stokes equations. And uh, we'll say backwards differentiation, that's something I've been involved with. And, and you know, this is certainly something to look at to see if it'll allow you to get more parallelism by, by getting a little bit extra in time. You're, of course, going to get parallelized in space. Um, molecular dynamics is one, of course, where there's real interest in parallelizing in time because there's there are very challenging long time integration problems that one wants to do. And, um, Although some incredibly good work has been done um, on it, the folks that built Anton have got lots of good code as well, an algorithm and code that's, that's pushed the limit of, of what you can do with molecular dynamics. There's still an, an ultimate wall because you typically, you know, you really want to integrate 10,000 atoms. That's the bread and butter computation. So here's a way maybe to get a little bit more um, out of, uh, out of the, the time domain. Um, and uh, this raises an interesting question. I don't know, maybe people have thought about this before, but I'll find out. Um, so you've got to get an initial guess for this Newton step to get going. And, and I said, well, you could take a, a coarser time step to get going. But that's just sequential. That's just one processor doing it. What if you had everybody do their own computation? Think about it this way. Suppose you look out into space and you say, oops, there's an asteroid going to hit the Earth. We know it's going to hit the Earth. What we don't know is where it's going to hit the Earth. And so we want everybody in the world to compute their best guess of where it's going to, going to hit the Earth. The data will be put out on the World Wide Web. And then we can do some sort of data mining to figure out which of these simulations seems to be the most accurate. Or we use learning theory, or who knows what. It's a little bit like a data assimilation problem. Um, in the sense that you would have all this data, these different, different processors would be giving different estimations of where this trajectory might be going, and you've got to figure out what's, what's real. OK, so I, I've never seen anything like that, but maybe people have. That's a great idea. Romberg integration. Great idea. How does this compare to waveform relaxation? 
Uh, okay, so let me let me refer you to the book on that one because that is explained in detail in the book, and this is the one of the questions always confusing. But yeah. waveform relaxation is really a, a, a space domain you know, uh, parallelization, not a time domain parallelization. Well, it is used in time. It is used in time. I'm saying. We'll we'll talk about this. I not in the papers that I've seen that uh, as uh, as as of the time of publication of the book. So I went into that in some detail because everybody always asks. Yes? Sorry, Rich, to interrupt. Um, any of the speakers who are going to catch the shuttle back to their hotels? Got yeah. To, we got started a little bit late. Okay. And here are the references. And thank you very much to the audience. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much. Thank you all. Okay.